Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program. This is a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew, author of such novels as Touch Your Nose and Jacoby Street and founder of Engine Books. Let's see what we have today. Uh, well, welcome to another wonderful episode of the Right Project podcast. I know I say that they are all wonderful, but this one really is. The rest, fake. Fake awesome. This one's real awesome. We are on the line with Rhea Rollman. Uh, she is one of the authors with uh, Acceptance, Stories at the Center of Us from Engine Books, and the author of the upcoming nonfiction book that is tentatively titled a queer history of St. John's Newfoundland, but that will not be the final title. Keep an, e- keep an ear out for the final title when it comes out, or maybe it is the final title. We'll find out. Um, thank you for joining us, Raya. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. It is. It is. It must be so strange for you to be on CHMR. Like that's, that's just odd for you. Have you ever heard of CHMR or done anything with CHMR in the past or? <laughs> um, on air um or in general just just uh, yeah do you, do, you, do you know what cgmr is i i have a bit of an inkling uh yeah i've i've yeah i believe you are the program manager at cgmr as well ah thanks for reminding me i yes yes that's right <laughs> i yeah. am <laughs> yeah um, yeah <laughs> in, in, a, in an even meta way i'm actually physically in chmr right now uh, yeah being recorded by you who are not <laughs> yeah 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 fun 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 uh okay so you've been doing some awesome work there lately uh you're getting really positive feedback about your story cause and effect in in uh acceptance the story the the collection we did in conjunction with quadrangle um what did you what kind of brought you to that story because if i'm right that was a bit more non-fiction like the book wasn't specific like there were we took fiction and non-fiction calls and stuff like that we called it all fiction but to my knowledge that was a more personal story for you uh what what led you to it if i can ask um i, I guess i it, it just kind of came to me really one day I, I, but i was playing with a couple of themes really um i i guess as background i mean i, I came out as trans what maybe three, four years ago now. Um, time kind of, time has all become a blur during the pandemic. But yeah, yeah, you know, some some years ago. Um, but of course, I, you know, I knew I was trans since I was very young. Um, and one of the things I found, you know, since coming out, and I, I've spoken to other, you know, I know other trans folks have experienced a similar thing. Uh, some people is, is that, you know, once you come out, um, there's kind of this nagging voice sometimes, oftentimes, you know, in the back of your head, um, when you engage with people, sometimes you can't help but wonder um, what parts of that engagement are driven by, you know, um, your identity as a trans person. So, you know, for instance, sometimes people will act really weird around you. And I think a lot of that is sometimes, you know, they're being nervous or uncertain how to act. They're being, you know, worried about offending or saying the wrong thing, um, you know, and and that can sometimes lead to some really strange and, and funny interactions. Um, you know, sometimes people, you might you might wonder, you know, if someone is being, you know, are they being accidentally transphobic? Are they being intentionally transphobic? You know, um, for example, if you're with a group of, you know, say mixed gender people and someone comes running up and is like, hey guys, or hey buys, and you're like, okay, <laughs> you know, is this someone who just refers to everyone by that name or <laughs> are they misgendering you <laughs> deliberately? Um, so so there, you know, and that's just just a kind of a tame example, but there are others. And then at the same time, um, I found that, you know, as you deal, I guess, as you come out you, and deal with uh, the experience of, of gender dysphoria, of a lifetime of gender dysphoria, you realize the different ways in which that's affected you over the years. And sometimes you don't realize all the ways until you do come out and you start, 
dealing with that, you know? So anyway, yeah, this, I, this notion of, okay, what parts of my identity, what parts of my day-to-day -day experience are being inflected and impacted by my trans identity um, is something that's, you know, I found on my mind quite a bit. And so I, I decided to kind of play with that and explore that a bit uh, in the story, uh, I guess, through the medium of a, of a ghost story, really. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Which is really very interesting. The idea of, of tying that narrative to a ghost story is interesting. Uh, it's really fun. It's uh, it's a, it's a cool take on it that I I wasn't expecting. I know it really grabbed the er the uh, the editor's attention. They were very like, oh, okay, well, have fun. We got a fair bit of that. I don't know if you've had a chance to read the collection yet, but it's um, the the editors had a very fun time when they were messaging me back. I was like, we blame you for this because like like there was a very much before when we opened submissions an expectation that we were going to get mostly. Um, let's say lit fiction human interest fiction and and creative nonfiction. uh we got a lot of that and there's a lot of that in there there's also some fantasy and some sci-fi and some horror because it's an engine books call and that brings out all the people from the woodwork so it uh, it ended up being a really diverse collection genre wise which i'm really proud of because like diversity is important Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited and glad that that anthology has come out. You know, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I think it's thrilling to see Engine putting out stuff like that. You know, we, we need more. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I hope folks get a chance to go check, check that out. I do too. It's a, uh, it's been a slow rollout getting it, uh, getting it out and ordering copies and stuff like that, but it's finally getting out to people and stuff like that. I, I thank people for their patience a whole bunch. It's uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, let's transition over and chat about your uh, your solo project, the um, what we are tentatively titling, titling the Queer History of Newfoundland and Labrador or St. John's Newfoundland. But we'll decide on that at the end. That's absolutely fine. That's that's you've gotten a uh, an arts and L grant to work on that, I believe, which we should mention as this is part of the promotion. Thank you, Arts and L. Um, for, thank for yes, thank you very much, Arts and L. Yes, yes. Um, what was the so? If I can ask, and I'll cut this out if I if I can't. But like, as it like, what did it feel like in those moments to get that grant? Because I know from conversations with you, you were questioning if like the project or you were were worth getting the grant at some point. Like if you were at that stage yet, if the project was there. And uh, and myself and uh, and our nonfiction editor Amanda Lamonte were very encouraging. Like, no, this is absolutely this. What was it like? Take me into that moment when you get that email or call that message. What was it like in that moment when you did get the grant approved? Oh, it was pure elation. <laughs> I mean, relief, you know, on multiple levels. I think relief on the one hand because of you know practical relief, it helps <laughs> immensely, you know, having this, the financial support, um, but also, I guess, relief in the sense of um, acknowledgement, you know, recognize, realizing that other people see this as a valid, important project as well. Um, so yeah, just absolute elation and, and a whole lot of relief. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Uh, tell me about the the project, the the queer history project, a little bit. What drew you to that? Uh, I imagine it was a bit slow going. A lot of these like um, history projects where you're getting little bits of information over time. It's like it builds in your head from what I've talked to people before, and all of a sudden it's like I think I I think there's is a book kind of thing. But uh, talk to me a little bit like that. What got the ball rolling? What kept it rolling? All that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Well. Um... Uh, you know, I've I've worked as a I guess as a journalist for uh, some years now, um, done a lot of, of of journalism, and so I had I'd been I had done research on little you know different little aspects of Newfoundland's queer history before, um, also as an activist for for that matter. You know, um, I, for example, like, like I remember uh, several years ago um, when we were doing some stuff around Pride Week, uh, we were trying to figure out okay. Like what 
what number pride is this anyway? You know, is it like the 20th annual pride, the 30th? What, what is it? No one knew. And so I went to the archives to try to dig back through, um, you know, the, the pride archives. Um, and, uh, and by archives, I, I went to Memorial University, look through their archives, um, see what, what they had. And th as I was looking through these archives, I realized, you know, wow, there's a really interesting, vast history of queer stuff uh, here in the province that I didn't know about. I mean, I lost whole days just researching, just, you know, looking through uh, press clippings and stuff. Th th there's a couple of really big files at the QE2 called, they're just titled homosexuality <laughs> because they, they were put together. I think they started to be put together back in the eighties um, and they've grown over the years. Anyway, yeah, so so I, I had come in contact with bits and pieces of this queer history um, over the years. And I had always thought, you know, someone should really pull this all together. You know, there's so many stories to be told here. Um, so much stuff that no one knows about that needs to be put out there in the public domain. You know, um, we, we need to realize we have such an in-depth queer history here in Newfoundland and Labrador and, uh, and honor that. Yeah. And uh, so it had always been in the back of my mind. And then when the pandemic hit, I didn't have a whole lot of time, so or it didn't have a whole lot to do, you know, when we were under lockdown. And so I started looking more seriously into uh, a lot of this history. And that's, I guess, where the project came from. You know, I was like, okay, you know, I'm just going to do this. Um, you know, these, these print archives are crumbling. Um, you know, uh, people who had played important roles in Newfoundland's queer history, they, you know, I was, I interviewed someone recently who pointed out that, you know, this is really the first uh, generation of out uh, queer people who are retiring and entering old age and who are, you know, publicly out, married in some cases. Um, Divorced and, in some cases. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you, you know, people who have this memory in their heads are, are were aging and, and dying in some cases. And so, uh, you know, I think it's important to document and preserve as much of that history as we can. So I, I set out to do that. And it's been such an amazing, rewarding project. Uh, yeah, no, that's amazing. I love that with all the, the, the learning the shared history. I love it also against the narrative. Like, um, I'll never forget. I, um, uh, I'm, I'm not forgetting right now. I'm, I'm struggling to fr to phrase something correctly. There's a there. There's also it also like it, like writing about the queer history of of Newfoundland. Also, to me, like it, it's important. And it's important to share that information and to document it while it's still in living memory before it stops. You know what I mean? But it also is a, to me, a, a strong pushback against the narrative that this is somehow new. You know what I mean? Like sometimes there is a, a counter progress narrative that it's like those newfangled kids with their pronouns and their x and their y or whatever um i'll never forget the uh the first time i i discussed anything like this with an older relative of mine a uh a, a friend of mine was um uh, was going through transition and um they'd called to uh ask me for my support i can't remember if there was just emotional support or if there was a a, a letter that they needed at the time because uh or something like that like 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 of sound because it was years ago like saying that like, they were of sound mind and body or something like that you would know that more than me i just remember they called for support and we ended up chatting for a while and they explained the procedure to me and they were very excited you know what i mean and as well they should be it's a big stage in their life. And I got excited as a result. You know, my friends talking to me about something that's exciting to them. So I got excited as a result. And just by chance, the next day, I was out at Tim Hortons with a, an older male relative of mine. Um, not too much older, but like a little bit older. And uh, I was telling him about it, sharing my excitement. I was still excited and jazzed up. And in a very like, Father knows best kind of way I can only describe the most well-intentioned, ridiculous transphobia I've ever heard in my life. He says, he puts his hand on my shoulder and says, no, Matt, that's science fiction. No, people don't actually do that. And it was this thing where he, he legit thought that someone was pulling my leg, that it oh, wasn't. Goodness. 
Like, it's not like he's like, ew, gross, that's horrible. He didn't think it was real. And he thought I was being, like, scammed and being asked to, like, contribute to a fund or something based on something that wasn't real. So wow. that's 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 the level we're dealing with, where, like, not terribly much older than me. And you know this yourself. That's a crazy story. But, like, like but like not much older than, than you or I. There is a narrative of like that this is something new. And I love that you're doing a history book, not just a book, because it reveals no, no, this has gone back to basically the beginning of Newfoundland, for for lack of a better term. I don't know. Yeah. How far back does it go? Well, uh, the, the I, book. I, not not yeah. homosexuality, the book. <laughs> yeah. Um I, I set the 20th century as kind of my parameters. Um, so I, I don't go past the year 2000, uh, just because once the internet comes into vogue, there's just the amount of, and, and especially once um, same-sex marriage, that campaign really kicks in, there was just too much material. So that's, a, that's another story that still needs to be told. So I'm focusing on the 20th century, um, and the bulk of it really looks, you know, from the 1960s through the 1990s is when a lot of the community building, a lot of the human rights campaigns geared up. So that's the bulk, that's, you know, the, the big emphasis. Um, and, and it's also when the, a lot of the, the queer social scene really exploded. Um, so so that's, that's what a lot of the book is looking at. But I also kind of look at earlier instances uh, where you see kind of hints of queer history in in Newfoundland Labrador you know there there was a, a there was actually there was a character an eccentric american in the 1800s in Newfoundland named professor uh charles henry danielle uh who played a really interesting role in Newfoundland history but um yeah he he was gay and and he, he had this penchant of going off to the mainland and falling in love and bringing his boyfriends back to Newfoundland and touring them around the province and trying to get them jobs and stuff. So anyway, you see interesting uh, kind of instances. There's um, uh, in the 1970s uh, in the Muse campus newspaper, you know, because the, the Muse, the student newspaper, uh, was one of the first print papers, I guess, where a lot of local dialogue around queer issues happened. And there's a fascinating letter from the early 70s where this student is basically calling on uh, gays and lesbians to come out. <laughs> he literally writes, come out, come out wherever you are. You know, he's, he's like, gays of Newfoundland, don't go to Toronto or, or Montreal to come out. Come out here at home in Newfoundland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's do it. And uh, so it's, it's so interesting to see that happening because for, for a lot of folks, that's what they did. They would, you know, they would come, they would come from rural communities to St. John's and then move on to Vancouver. Vancouver or Montreal or Toronto, which had larger established queer communities. But but you see this, this, this kind of core developing here in Newfoundland who were saying, well, you know, you don't have to go away. You know, we have our own community here as well. And um, it's it's really exciting. There, there, there was also, there's also a really interesting, one of the things that you see in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, you know, there's this kind of long running, um, I guess, tension in queer community between, uh, you know, those who see, uh, I guess, the, the question being, how radical do you want your activism to be? And uh, activism in Newfoundland uh, and Labrador, uh, the activists face that question as well. So you, you have um, this relatively radical group uh, in the late 80s, early 90s called GALT, Gays and Lesbians Together. Um, and they, um, uh, they they got kind of denounced by 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 others who for for being they were accused of being mainlanders come here with their radical activism, <laughs> um, you know. Um, uh, but it, it wasn't true, you know. I mean, it was founded by Newfoundlanders from rural communities, you know. Um, so you do see this perception that it is something new or that it's something from away, but it's totally not true. So I think it's important that we kind of uh, acknowledge the long running queer history that has existed here in this province. Big time, big time. And, and, and it's important to get all sides of history. And this is a side that's been ignored for of uh, too long. And I'm so glad that you're writing the book and that that engine can be a part of it. Like, history without going into as many different contexts as you can isn't history it's fantasy you know like like 
that's it's just the way it is. Um, this is wonderful. I'm really excited about this book, and uh, what I've read about it is amazing. Uh, what a man has read about it is amazing. We're just thrilled. It's gonna be gonna be huge. Gonna be great, Raya. Thank you so much for bringing it to us. Cannot thank you enough. I'm out of character. I'm no longer Matt Ledrew, the CHMR host. Now I'm Matt Ledrew, like publisher, thanking his author. Oh no, the veil has lifted. I've messed up. <laughs> um, one of the things that's really struck me personally doing this work is is uh, digging into the history of trans activism here in the province. You know, I mean, I mean, I did not realize until I started doing interviews for this book. Um, some of the, the the real fights that were waged by early trans activists here in the 1990s. I mean, it, it's remarkable. Uh, before there existed any kind of st st protocols around how people accessed surgery or access hormones, uh, you know, these people were literally writing the protocols and fighting um, the medical establishment here in the province for for access uh, to hormones, for example. So it's been really. Um, moving, I think, to read about the struggles of, and I didn't learn about this. I didn't hear about any of this, you know, when I was growing up. Um, yet there, there have been these amazing activists doing this work over these, over the decades. So, you know, it's been so rewarding to, to learn about that. Um, and, and I, I think we need to share and honor that heritage. Um, and anyway, yeah, you, you know, it's, oh yeah. Um, and, and it's one of the things, it's just astonished me how far back uh, organized activism goes in this province. You know, I mean, in the back in the mid 1970s, there was organized activist groups uh, here in the community with basically, you know, there was a the equivalent almost of a queer community center operating out of a uh, house on Waterford Bridge Road, you know, with a community library and a, and a phone support line. And this was going on in the 1970s. That's amazing. And, uh, it's, it's astonishing, like it blew my mind because I, I had never known about this, uh, heard, any of, heard any of this. Uh, that's, yet that's I've, I've... for context, that's that's barely, like barely 10 years after some regions in the province still didn't have phones. Like my, my mother growing up, it would live, when lived in a small community, did not, there was not a telephone in the community. So that's... Yeah. Massive, you know what I mean? That's that's Huge. that's almost to the beginning of phones. There was a phone support line. So how yeah. can we say this is new? You know, exactly. And and it, I mean, I've I've interviewed folks who say that uh, you know, being a, for folks from rural com who are living in rural communities, uh, you know, in in Long Harbor or in Gander, who say that their lives were literally saved by being able to reach out to find a community with other. Uh, queer people elsewhere in the province um, through these groups. So it's, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really, it's humbling in a lot of ways to, to realize what, a, what an immense foundation of activism exists in this province. And not just activism, but community, I think is a better term. Um, but it's also really exciting to, to be able to share this history uh, with more, with, with the public. Yeah, big time. Big time. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Anyway. I love that. Good. Um, wonderful. Uh, Rhea Rollman, who inspired you to write, if anyone? Um, oh, my. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I mean, my parents were always very encouraging when I was when I was young. So uh, I think that 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 helped. Um, and then all, all the authors that I read when I was growing up, you know, they were the ones who, who really inspired me. That's an awesome answer. I like that. And really yourself, just take it on yourself. You're like, yeah, I inspired me to write. None of those <laughs> flim flam curse that's allowed on CHMR. T -t Ray Rollman, if you were a jam, what kind of jam would you be? I <laughs> the look on your face. <laughs> I I must have skipped that question. Um, strawberry rhubarb. Excellent. Why? Is there a reason? If not, that's fine. It's actually the only jam I eat. Uh <laughs> okay. That's fair. So you're a cannibal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You're a cannibal. I, guess. I understand. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are what you eat. 
Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you eat what you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Rhea, does the act of writing, of working on this book, uh, uh, either your short story, Cause and Effect, or, or the queer history, does it energize you or does it exhaust you? Like when you're done writing for a session or for a day, do you find it's giving you energy and now you're going to go get the day started? Or it is, is that it? You're just drained from the act of creation? Oh, it energizes me. You know, um, I, I've some other projects I've worked on, they, they'll exhaust me, but something that enthuses me, like both of these projects, um, yeah, it energizes me. Like I'll start writing and I won't want to go to bed, but I'll have to go to bed, you know? Um, and I'll get angry that I have to go to bed because I'll want to just continue writing. Um, you know, I really understand that sentiment that there's not enough hours in the day because once I really get into it, I, I just don't want to stop, you know? I, I, yeah, the, the thrill just keeps building. Um, and it's not been like that for every writing project I've done, but for this, yes. So for what I'm working on right now, it, it has. So I'm really thankful for that. Okay, awesome, awesome. Rhea Rollman, what does literary success or book success look like to you? Like in your mind, this project you're working on right now, The Queer History of Newfoundland or St. John's or whatever we're calling it, when is that successful? What's the goal that you're like, oh man, if it does this? Oh, huh. um, gosh, if, if, it, if it leads to other people doing more of the same, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, in, in the sense that, you know, I've really struggled with um, the, the acknowledging that it's impossible to encapsulate the entirety of this history in one book. Uh, so I'm just gonna do the best I can to flag a lot of important things. I hope other people will kind of use it as a foundation to write other books and to explore aspects that I couldn't get into that much in depth, you know? Um, so if if it leads other people to come forward with their own stories and, and share their histories and stories and write more books about their histories and stories. I think for me, that would be really successful. Um, yeah, that, that would be a great outcome to come from this, you know? Um, and of course, uh, if it makes people, I guess, feel a greater sense of pride and empathy in, uh, in our queer legacies and identities here in the province. Yes, excellent. I, I, I love that answer and I agree completely. Yeah, yeah. Rhea Rollman, if you could tell your younger writing self any one thing, what would it be? I would just say keep writing, you know. Um, there, there's been times over the years where I've kind of felt discouragement or moved away from, from writing, pursued other things. But yeah, you know, I would, I always seem to come back to it. So I, I would say, yeah, you know, just, yeah, just keep writing <laughs> and have faith in it. If your body of work as a writer turned into an animal, what animal? Oh, I know exactly. I'm just trying to remember the name of it. I don't know if you know what this is. Do you know what the pokeroo is? Yes. It would be a pokeroo. That's, That's exactly amazing. It. Yeah. Pokeroo, pokeroo. I used to have nightmares about that as a child. Really? Uh, I loved it, but I used to have nightmares because he would poke it, he would jump out from around things and be like, Pokeroo, Pokeroo. So he was the monster in my bedroom. Like I, I used to go to sleep at night being like, what's he behind? And I didn't think he would do anything to me. Like he was just going to jump out and be like, Pokeroo, Pokeroo, and then bounce off. But I mean, isn't that what good writing is supposed to do? Like it, it pops up when you least expect it and it makes Absolutely. it, it has an impact and, you know, it doesn't hurt you. Like, Terrifies you children. Yeah, 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 but you have to act on it. It just like it just it just provokes. Well, Ray of Roman, thank you for all of the work you do. Thank you for inviting me uh, back in the day to have this show, Right Project Podcast, on CHMR. The show would not exist without Ray of Roman. Thank you all. Very thank you very much, everyone listening who enjoys this program. Uh, thank you for working on this book and for bringing it to Engine Books. Everyone keep an eye out for it. It will be out mid-2022, possibly summer, late summer, fall. Still getting there, still figuring out, but we will send updates as they come, 2022. Uh, and thank you for joining me, Ray. Thank you so much for, for doing this amazing program and for all your support and great books.
lovely. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.